Guys, it's great to be with you today. We're continuing our series, Go. Uh, over these few weeks, we've been exploring the hows and whys of going out into our everyday lives to share our faith in Jesus with people who don't have faith in Jesus. And I've been asked today to speak specifically about the message we have to share. What is the core Christian message and how and why should we share it? And I think it's easy to get confused in this whole area, particularly when the word evangelism is used, because it gets associated either with the experts in the church, the vicar, the preachers, the more natural evangelists among us, or it can get associated with some of those perhaps more off-putting people in the city centres who shout at passers-by about the fires of hell. So it's become more popular for Christians nowadays to move away from this spoken evangelism altogether. You might have heard the saying, always preach the gospel, but use words if necessary. I don't know if you've heard that saying. It's a sort of, if I just love people, then they'll see who Jesus is sort of approach. And there's so much I want to say amen to about that. But as usual, there's a healthy balance somewhere in the middle. Think about what Paul said to his friends in Greece. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, the good news about Jesus but our lives as well. Both were in it, talking about faith and the loving relationships in which these conversations were had. Think about our Lord himself, Jesus, Matthew 4.23. He went about proclaiming the good news and healing every disease and sickness. He spoke the message and he showed compassion. So that means if we're Christians, all Christians actually, as well as the way we live our lives, some form of spoken testimony will always be required to bring somebody to faith. And that's why today I've got two aims for my talk. First, I want to explain exactly what the core Christian message is. And then I want to go into practically how we can share this faith, particularly in today's culture. So if you're here today and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, the first bit, the main part of the talks, really the main bit for you. But do listen to the second bit as well, because you can use it to judge whether your Christian buddies are evangelizing you in the right way. But if you are here today, which is most of you, and you are a Christian, it doesn't mean the first part of the talk is any less important, actually. Because unless the good news about Jesus Christ is still really good news to you personally and passionately, it's highly unlikely that the people you interact with will be moved by it either. So we've got a passage today, and it's Mark chapter 8, starting from verse 27. Uh, And as we begin by focusing on what this core Christian message is, we're going to see this passage divide into three parts. Three questions that have to be answered if we're going to lead somebody to faith. Who is Jesus? Why did he come? What's he asking of me? Okay? So that's where we're going today, particularly in the main part of this talk. I'm going to read it through, so listen to the story. I'm going to put the highlights of each section on the screen before you. So starting verses 27 to 29, who is Jesus? Jesus asked his disciples, uh, Jesus and his disciples went onto the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people, people out there, say that I am? They replied, Some are saying you're John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. But what about you? Jesus asked, Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, You, Jesus are the Messiah. Now, to the average guy and girl we meet on the street, saying Jesus is the Messiah isn't going to mean very much. But basically what Peter's saying is, Jesus, you're the all-powerful, eternal king. Okay, so first and foremost, that's what this word Messiah means. But actually, in our culture, even this royal language is somewhat lost on us. That's not to say we don't respect and love our queen, I'm thrilled to have the queen that we've got. She's amazing. But it's not as if day to day we're that aware of the impact she has on our lives. And when the time comes for Charles or William to take her place, it's going to seem like a huge thing in the first instance, but there won't be a a revolution of the kind there was when back in the day, new kings came to power. Back in the day, a new 
uh, football. It's like a new football manager coming into a team. So a new king coming into a nation was much more like being in a, ki- in a team and wondering what the new football manager was going to be like. Suddenly, everything is up in the air. What's this manager going to be like? What's his style of play? Will he want to select me? Is he going to be an encouraging arm-round-the-shoulder kind of manager? Or is he going to rule the team with an iron fist? You see, in football, if you're in a team, the appointment of a new manager was actually the making or breaking of any player in that team. If you're a Chelsea fan, back in 2013, I think it was, one matter was your player of the season. A new manager came in, and one matter was the first one to be kicked out of the door. And it's much more like that with the ancient kings. Depending on who this new king was and what this king is like, everything's up in the air. Livelihoods were at stake. Quality of life was at stake. Life at stake was was actually at stake, particularly if you had the wrong surname or the new king sensed any disloyalty among his subjects. But Peter called Jesus the Messiah, which is actually to acknowledge him as the king above all kings, not just God's appointed king, but God himself as this all-powerful, eternal king. That's what we read at Christmas, isn't it? Do you remember that passage from Isaiah 9 in our nine lessons and carols? For unto us a child is born, to unto us a son is given. That's Jesus, isn't it? But what does it go on to say? He will be called mighty God. In fact, it says the government of the entire world will be on his shoulders. In fact, as we go further into the Bible, there's a passage that says Jesus holds the entire universe together. The stars, the planets in their orbits, and the moons in orbit around that. And that really struck me the other day when I was swinging just my three-year-old daughter around by her hands. It's really hard as she gets bigger to hold on, particularly if your hands are sweaty and you start to go a little bit faster. But let's scale this up a bit. Let's say I trade that with John Hudson. It would look a little bit strange. We might try it after the service. But this great weight is going to want to fly off in the opposite direction. No offense, John. But let's scale this up even more. Who could get an oven into orbit with a chain? Perhaps Dino could. Let's scale it up even more. A car. A house. How about spinning the Earth, which is 6,000 billion billion tons, around the sun at 30 kilometers a second and holding on. We call that force gravity. Jesus says, that's all me. And I never weary. If he did, it would be bad news. (laughs) Be flung off around the universe. So if we're going to be concerned what any king's regime is like, it's got to be Jesus's, hasn't it? I mean, who else has this power to influence our lives like him? So it begs the question, what is he like then? Well, that's what Isaiah 9 goes on to tell us. And thankfully, he's the prince of peace too. He's a wonderful counselor, a comforter, and a guider. It says he's the eternal father, a true family man who loves and cares for his people if they're under his rule. Because you see, Jesus' rule and his blessings can't be separated. Okay, Jesus can't care for us unless he's ruling over us, but he'll never rule over us without caring This is the foundation of the good news. Who is Jesus? First of all, he is a perfect, eternal, all-powerful king. So why did he come to earth? Why didn't Jesus just stay on his heavenly throne and govern the universe from there? Well, let's read on. Verses 30 to 33 say this. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone else that he was the Messiah. A little bit strange, so we'll come back to that. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man, another word for the Messiah, must suffer many things and be rejected, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took Jesus aside and began to tell him off. This isn't how kings rule. But Jesus turned and looked at him and his disciples, and he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. 
So what's going on here? Well, as well as being the divine king, the Messiah was also a promised rescuer. Peter and all of his fellow Jewish buddies had been waiting years for this king to finally arrive and solve all of their biggest problems. And if you ask the Jews back then what their biggest problem was, they would have said that Roman Empire. So they lived 2,000 years ago, and there was this brutal regime, and they were saying, it's oppressing us, it's belittling us, it's actually crippling and cramping our quality of life day after day. So for them, this word Messiah could also be translated as the solution or the answer. Basically, the thing that people most put their hope in. And for the Jews, it was this king to come and finally overthrow Caesar and drive out all of his soldiers. But actually, we could say all around the world, everyone has their own messiahs. They wouldn't be calling them that. But we all have some hope that life would finally be okay if only dot, dot, dot. That I will finally be happy when my world looks like that. And whatever thing or person or outcome we put in that dot, 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 that is our Messiah. So if Peter's just said, I've got it, Jesus, you're the Messiah, then why has Jesus said, shh, don't tell anyone else about it? When you expect Jesus to say, you've got it, Peter, now go and tell the world. Well, not yet. Because while Jesus had come to be their greatest hope, the way he'd be their greatest hope was beyond their human way of understanding. The disciples were ready to race out and tell all their Jewish buddies, our rescuing king is here. But what would have happened? They would have stuck Jesus in a palace, put guards around him, trained up an army, and declared war on their enemy. Is that why Jesus came? If it was, then he would have declared war on Rome from his heavenly throne and flicked Caesar off the earth like an ant. But Jesus knew that actually their biggest problem wasn't one enemy empire. Their biggest problem was an entire human race who'd separated themselves from God's loving rule and care. An entire human race, including themselves, who'd pushed away their creator because deep down they still wanted to call the shots. That's what the Bible calls sin. You see, we all want the world to be a better place. But here's the question. If God really got rid of all the problems in the world, do you really think you'd still be around to enjoy it? The disciples were interviewing Jesus for the wrong job. Okay, so they had a vacancy for him to come and to destroy one of their enemies. Jesus had a plan to come and save millions of his. And he'd do it, it says here, by dying a sinner's death, by lying in a tomb, so that three days later he could rise above it all and offer peace forgiveness, a second chance, and eternal life to all these people who should have kept him as king in the first place. I think we can say so much more than God is love. God is love. But people out there have no idea what that means. They have no idea how radical God's love is. So every morning, I, I spend half an hour reading the Bible and praying, and the other day, I'd sat down with a plan to read two chapters of Luke's Gospel, okay? And I sat down, and I read the first two verses, and I spent the next half an hour just staring at them, absolutely blown away. These were the verses that I read. When it came for Jesus to die, the men who were guarding Jesus began mocking him and beating him. They blindfolded Jesus and demanded, prophesy them. Who hit you? Just close your eyes and picture that scene. This is God himself, with a hood over his head, being pushed and kicked and punched around a room by a load of thugs. God himself. At any moment, he could have called down a million angels to burn these jobs up. 
He was Jesus. He could hold the earth in orbit. So these jumps were like a tennis ball to him. He could have made them the first people on the moon. But he took the beating and he stayed silent to the end just because he wanted a relationship with me infinitely more than I wanted anything to do with him. That is God's love. So if he's already come to earth to do that, to give that second chance, then what's he actually asking of us today? Let's finish the passage. Verse 34, then he called the crowd to himself along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever gives up their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, everything it has to offer, yet forfeit their soul? It's pretty clear. Jesus did come and has come to pay the penalty and consequences of someone else's sin, but not everyone's. He's saying heaven and hell is still real because not everyone actually wants to come back under this divine rule and care. I've always found it really hard to admit I'm wrong. Okay, if you know me, you'll know it's still the case. But I remember particularly back in the day when I was at school being held up into my head of year's office and the conversation went on and on and it went something like this. Well, but I know you were smoking in the woods because I saw you. Okay, so why are you insisting you were sat in Mrs. Inman's maths class when she was the one that sent me out looking for you? Okay, so why is it so hard, even when you know you've been busted, and you know they know you've been busted, and they know you know you've been busted, why is it still so hard to admit you're wrong? But that's exactly what Jesus is asking us to do. He's not asking us to measure up to a standard. He's, admitting, he's asking us to admit that we've fallen short of one. Luke 5, he puts it like this. It's not the healthy or those who think they're healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I haven't come to call the righteous or those who think they're righteous, but sinners to repentance. In other words, he's saying, do you think you need my forgiveness? Do you think you need healing? Do you have any idea how much you need me? And actually, that's what repentance means. It's a fancy word, and I suggest you don't use it with your mates. But it means a literal change of mind about the state of your life and about God. And that's why not everyone wants to do it, because it means saying, I got it wrong. It actually means laying down, giving up some of our old messiahs that we used to rely on. And it might actually mean that we wrestle with some of those new decisions for the rest of our 80 years on earth. But Jesus is saying here, nothing in this world is worth forfeiting your soul for anyway. Our wholeness, having peace with God and joy forever. When I was in my 20s, a friend said to me, still a dear friend, he said, Rob, do you know that until you actually commit your life to Jesus you're still actively rejecting it. Until you actually commit to Jesus, you're still actively rejecting him. And that was a complete revelation to me because I'd always assumed that I was sat on the fence, faith-wise, on some quite comfortable fence, actually, where it was a sort of neutral zone where I'd still not quite made up my mind about this God character. But Jesus says, there is no fence. There's only sides. And the dividing line is not whether I give to charity or not, not whether I work in sales or become a monk. The dividing line is whether I believe Jesus is king, whether I know he came to die for my sins, and whether or not I actually want him to be my saviour and my king. So if you're here today and you've just realised I really need to switch allegiance then I'm going to give you an opportunity to make that commitment in just a moment. But before we do, and whilst you really consider that, I did promise some practical advice about how we can share our faith in everyday situations. Because what I've just done is preach at you for 20 minutes. That's not going to go down very well with your buddies. So here we go. Uh, Six lessons and six minutes. 
on personal evangelism from this passage. Don't worry, don't scribble them all down. We can send this out by email or over Facebook. Number one, listen more than you talk. That's how Jesus started this passage. What are the people out there saying about me? So what makes your friends tick? How are they wired? What do they fear? Because actually, that's what Jesus will probably use to draw them to himself. When he saw the disciples arguing among themselves who was going to be the very greatest, he didn't come in and say, stop being ambitious. He said, ah, you want to be the very greatest? Follow me and we'll serve the very least. When he met the woman at the well, who was on her sixth fella, he didn't come in and say, relationships aren't the answer. He said, come and have a relationship with me, and all that stuff, that empty void you're trying to fill, will begin to work itself out. My dad, he's a real thinker. Okay, he likes to read up on his subject, but why should intellect be a barrier to Jesus? Two years ago, I had the thought, it was Father's Day, that I'll buy him a book on the Reformation. Okay, a book like that, three months of core Christian doctrine for him. And he devoured it. The next thing I did was loaned him my book on Old Testament context. If anyone wants it, you can have it. Next, I pushed my luck a little bit with a commentary on Mark's gospel. Now he's in a Bible study, all of his own free will. Listen out for Jesus' way in. That's number one. Number two, bring it back to Jesus. Okay, it's easy for faith conversations to become a bit of a debate, and you've probably experienced it yourself. Is there a God at all? What's the probability of evolution? There's so many other faiths. How about all your religious wars? You might win the odd argument, but you won't win many true converts. So when the conversation is going in that sort of direction, here's what I say. Just suppose there was a God. Would you want him to be like Jesus? See where that conversation goes. Bring it back to him. Right when I'd just come to faith, I, me and my buddies after the pub used to watch the boxing back at my flat. And at some point, they'd always ask me something about faith. And I didn't know, so I said, why don't we have a look? So I'd open the Bible, go to the Gospels, Luke's got loads of stories, and just read a story about Jesus. He's the answer, not my debating skills. After a while, they started calling it Bible and boxing. By the end of it, they dropped the boxing, and now they're Christians. Right, number three, use their language, right, okay? Use their language, use other people's language. So just be aware that people think sin is an out-of-date list of rules from Victorian times, or they think it's decadent chocolate, okay? But they all know about broken relationships, and they all know what it's like to be mugged off. So does God. So use their language. You know the game Articulate? Do you know it? It's a board game, and you've got a card, a word comes up, you've got to describe it to your teammate without using the word on the card. Okay? So, I've got tree. Uh, it's got leaves. A tree, Claire would say, otherwise I'd just ditch her from my team altogether. But it's, that, that's, that's the game. Okay? But just imagine you're playing Articulate, and the word comes up, sin. You're not allowed to use the word sin, but what does it mean in their language? Saved. It's Christian jargon. They don't know what you're talking about. Heart, presence, use everyday language. Four, make it personal. Okay, you weren't saved because you're better than anyone else. You were saved by God's grace. So that means you can be honest about your journey and even any current doubts or struggles. And actually, there's two reasons why this is important. One, it's actually very compelling in today's culture where people are craving for authenticity. But secondly, it makes complete sense of the gospel message, doesn't it? If you're coming across as the sorted Christian, you are contradicting the gospel message. It's not the healthy I've come for, but the sick. Did that change when you become Christian? Did you suddenly sort out all of your doubts? Is your life now perfect? He's still your saviour and your Lord. So be honest about your personal journey. It's very compelling, and it witnesses to the gospel. Number five, don't try and say everything you have to say enough. You'll need to cover three questions when you lead someone to faith. Who is Jesus? Why did he die? What's he asking of me? And this last bit is the bit we tend to fiddle with. Because we think if we preach the hard bits, they're not going to come to faith. Let me explain why that's wrong. 2 Corinthians 4 says that through the whole gospel message, it's like a key, it unlocks the same power that put the stars in the sky to bring someone to faith. 
So if I mess around with that key, can you unlock the power? You can't. So you don't have to say everything, but you have to say enough. There is, an, there is an earthly cost or an eternal investment, but if Jesus has put the price of his life on our soul, then you better believe eternity will be worth it. There is, in this passage here, a come and die element to come and live, truly live. Preach the whole gospel. Number six, then finally, and this is most important, make sure an invitation has actually been made. Doesn't matter how ripe and ready somebody is, they actually need to be asked to come to faith. That's how God has wired his church. I used to go on a mission with a guy called Michael Green, okay? And on one particular mission, we got to about day four, and I was telling him about someone I'd been uh, talking to a lot that week. And he said to me, have you actually asked that person to become a Christian yet? To which I said, no, I don't think they're ready. To which he said, how do you know? To which I said, I don't. What does ready look like? They haven't got any doubts? Have you guys got it all worked out? That their life's sorted? Are you guys perfect? Have you told them that Jesus is king? Do they believe he died for sins? Do they actually want him to be their forgiver, their healer, their saviour and their Lord? If you've covered that, there's only one question left. It's one of the things stopping you becoming a Christian today. And that's what I want to ask anyone who's still wavering in their faith today. So would you all like to stand?